Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today is Easter, or the Feast of First Fruits. Today we greet each other as Christians, as those who believe Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. Today we say, He is risen, He is risen indeed. Today is an exceptional day in the life of our country and in that of Christ's church, where local churches are asked not to gather. How are we to make sense of all this? How are we to see these things? Well, let me provide you with three illustrations or examples that will perhaps bring clarity as to how we are to read these moments in time. The first is this exercise called Sudoku. Now, I am not good at this at all. In fact, I have never completed a Sudoku without help. But one of the things that helped me immensely was finding all of the answers to all of the Sudokus in the back. Friends, in life, as we look at what's taking place, what we need to do is look in the back of the book. In the back of the book, we have all the answers to our questions. So let me encourage you as you try to make sense of everything that's taking place, that you would look at the back of the book. Because in the back of the book, we have the answers to life's questions. The second example I'd like to use is when I was growing up, my brother and I, when we were probably, hopefully in elementary school, we would get these plastic model cars and plastic model planes. Now, this is a, a wooden car that someone who had skills put together. But when we were small, we would get those models and we would start putting them together randomly without looking at the directions. In fact, if we looked at the directions, we were not quite sure that we would have been able to understand them. But at the end of putting the model car or model plane together, we would always have all these pieces left over. And we would take seats and we would glue them to the roof of the car or we would take airplane wings and we'd attach them to the doors and we'd think, oh man, that is so cool. And yet, as cool as we thought it might have been, it wasn't right. We didn't follow the directions. And right now, there are a lot of people taking various pieces and putting them together. And you know, folks, it's simply not right. They're not following what the scriptures are telling us about a single story. And at the center of that story is Jesus Christ. He is the one who enables us on this day to have hope. The third illustration or example I want to share with you is recently as spring is coming about, I got on my lawn tractor and I began to do work, but it would not start. And I found that the battery was dead, so I had to buy another battery. But the battery has a line that runs from it to the solenoid. Now, I'm talking about things I have no idea what they actually do. But there's a battery, and it's attached to a solenoid. The solenoid looks like this. That solenoid then travels along that line to a fuse. And what I found interesting is I turned the key on, and nothing happened. I went and bought a battery. I put the battery in. It worked for two days, and it didn't work anymore. So then I had to test the solenoid. And, and you might uh, respond and explain to me how all this works, and I'm just assuring you that no matter how hard you explain it, I will not understand it. But I know that the battery is linked to the solenoid. I then went out and bought another solenoid. I put the solenoid in, and it still wouldn't start. So then I had to buy fuses. These are only $5. I bought the fuses. And the line that runs from the solenoid, from the battery to the key, has a fuse in it. I replaced the fuse, and the tractor fired right up. Our theology, what we believe at our core, links all this stuff together. So that in the present, even though things seem so tumultuous, it can make sense and we can have peace. And how is that possible? Well, because at our core, we believe that God is controlling everything. And we believe that what we are experiencing is something that has happened. There is nothing new under the sun. And because of that, because we believe these things are true, you and I can have rest. We can have peace in this life. I'm wanting to take this day, Matthew 28, Resurrection Sunday, and I'm wanting to put it in its historical context. In that context of the upper room, Jesus says in Matthew 26, 21, that Judas is going to betray him. He then says in verses 33 through 35 that Peter is going to deny him. 
And the disciples know that Jesus has been talking about his own death. Think about it. You and I deal with viruses. We deal with social distancing. We deal with financial uncertainty. And as bad as those things are, we're not dealing with the death of the Messiah. So Judas will betray him. Peter will deny him. And Jesus is going to die. This is horrific. So what are we supposed to do with all of this? The one thing that you and I have that the scriptures always speak about is simply this. But God, God is involved in all of this. And we have to remember that God says two things. He will never leave us or forsake us and that he is always going to keep his promises. And how do we know that God is always with us? How do we know that he's going to keep all of his promises? We know because of an empty tomb. And that is really what I want us to focus on this morning as we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. Now, let's go back to Palm Sunday. The Gospel of John, the author, John, cites Zechariah 9.9 in referencing Palm Sunday. And John says this in chapter 12, verse 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. On Monday, Thursday, as they gather in the upper room, Jesus is with his disciples and they are frightened because Jesus has just told them Judas is going to betray him, Peter's going to deny him, and he's going to die. And yet in verse 1 of chapter 14, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Do not fear. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And Jesus will then say in John chapter 16, verse 33, In this world, that which in which you and I currently live, in this world you will have tribulation. You will have trial. You will have temptation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome. On Good Friday in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus had received the sour wine and he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus has fulfilled for us the seed promise of Genesis 3.15. Jesus has completed for us the blood picture found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. So now we come to Matthew 28. We know that the times are difficult, not just for them, but for us. And we come to Matthew 28, and in Matthew chapter 28, if you have an ESV Bible, you'll see that there are three paragraphs. Each of those paragraphs are tied together and they're all saying a dominant thing. Let me read the text. And as you'll see inside uh, this paragraph, this chapter, the first paragraph beginning in verse 1 runs all the way to verse 10. And you have this encounter with the angel and with Jesus by Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. But let's begin in verse 1. The Bible says, Now after the Sabbath, Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Those same soldiers, those same guards are going to reappear in verse 11. But let's continue. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. Stop fearing. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. In obedience, as it were, to what the angel said, verse 8, So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go, and go to Galilee, and there they will see me. My friends, what we see in the first 10 verses is that Jesus Christ is alive. Do not fear. Not only did the angel of the Lord tell that to the disciples of Jesus, but Jesus himself says to his disciples, I am not here, I have risen. And now here he is before them. The tomb is indeed empty. There you and I need not fear. Now notice what happens in verses 11 through 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard 
went into the city. Remember, they saw and heard the same things that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary saw and heard. And they went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while he were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. What we are seeing in Matthew 28 is that Jesus Christ is alive and Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is the very thing that those soldiers and the religious establishment were denying. They were saying that Jesus is not alive and that Jesus Christ is not Lord. But that's the message that you and I have as the people of God, not just to one another, but to everyone, everywhere at all times. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is Lord. And then in verses 16 through 20, the next paragraph, tells us what Jesus then says to his disciples who have gathered. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority, this is in fulfillment of the Daniel 7 vision, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is in answering the prayer of Matthew 6. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Go therefore, verse 19, make disciples of all nations as you are going, as you are going out and living life. Tell people that Jesus Christ is alive. Tell people that Jesus Christ is Lord baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Look at verses 5 and 6 one more time. The angel says to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come and see. Come and see. What answer do we have to all of the fears that seek to consume us in the present, come and see the empty tomb. Jesus is alive. See the place where he lay. And then notice verse 7. It says, then go quickly and tell his disciples, go and tell that he has risen from the dead. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Friends, this passage is teaching us that Jesus Christ is alive, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those were the very two things that the soldiers and the religious establishment in verses 11 through 15 were denying, that he wasn't alive, that he isn't Lord. But what do we know from this text? Jesus Christ is alive. Sin has been crushed, the grave has been conquered, and the mission is being completed. He's alive. What are we to be telling one another? What are we to be telling our neighbors and our co-workers and our families and friends? Jesus is alive. But not only is Jesus alive from the tax, but Jesus is Lord. This ties directly to Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 28. Jesus is alive. Jesus is Lord. So what's next? How do we respond to all of this? We see life on the horizontal and it is filled with trial. It is filled with temptation. It is filled with tribulation. What are we supposed to do with all this? Well, first and foremost, Jesus Christ is alive. And secondly, Jesus Christ is Lord. So how do we respond to it? Well, remember what the angel of the Lord told the disciples. Remember what Jesus told the disciples. Do not fear. This is the come and see part. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. His people, the people of God, you and me, we need not fear those who can destroy the body but have no power over the soul. Right now, we are fearful of the virus. We are fearful of social distancing. We are fearful of financial impact. We are fearful of the political bickering. When we go out to the grocery store, we can feel and see the fear and anxiety by how people behave. What is our answer as the people of God? What is our response to all of this fear? Our response is come and see. 
The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. That's our response, and therefore we need not fear. But secondly, secondly, the church is still on mission. Jesus Christ is alive and he is Lord. The church is still on mission. Verse 18 says, as you are going, make disciples of the nations. That's what we're doing. Come and see the empty tomb. Now go and tell that Jesus Christ is alive, that Jesus Christ is Lord. We need to tell everyone that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. That's the confession in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Those are the two things that the soldiers in the religious establishment in verses 11 through 15 were denying, that Jesus is alive and that Jesus is Lord. That is our response to everything we're seeing in the horizontal. Are you afraid for your health and finances and the flow of political nonsense that's befalling all of us? Do not be afraid. Jesus is alive. Jesus is Lord. Are you confused as to what happens next? Well, let us remember that sin has been crushed, the grave has been conquered, and the mission is still being completed. And anytime you find yourself afraid, let us remember two things. Jesus is alive and Jesus is Lord. Let this be our message to one another during this season of uncertainty. Friends, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the simplicity of this message. It began a long time ago and it continues to this day. Jesus is alive and Jesus is Lord. As your people, we believe this. As a consequence of this truth, of these truths, we need not fear. And when we do fear, may we come and see the empty tomb and may we believe in the resurrected Christ. Now may we go and tell that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he has received from his Father all authority and that authority has been passed to his people, his church, so that they would extend his reach globally. And one day we believe that the entire earth will be covered with the knowledge of your glory as the waters cover the sea. So, Father, help us on this day to proclaim widely that Jesus Christ is alive and Jesus Christ is Lord. We thank you for these moments that we've had together as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than, than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within you, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. And remember, he is risen. He is risen indeed.